there you go. Um, the Washington Labor Education Research Center is housed at South Seattle College. We serve workers statewide across the state of Washington. And it is the tradition of the South Seattle College and we at the Labor Center to start each of our meetings with a land acknowledgement. And I would love to have that slide up. You can read along with me. We at the Washington State Labor Education and Research Center, um, we are based at South Seattle College, Georgetown campus. We acknowledge that we work, teach, and live on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past, present, and future. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. And we have included over here the links to a really wonderful interactive tool you can use it to look up the lands on which you were born, you currently inhabit or work. And we invite you to share in the chat, what lands do you hail from? Where do you join us from tonight in the great ethernet? <clears throat> Tonight's event builds on several prior trainings and briefings and research reports we have done on workers' rights, health and safety in our current pandemic. We have maintained a special focus throughout on the needs of Washington's low wage essential workers. Our prior work is all available on our college website, which Emily, it might be wonderful if you drop our website into the chat. Um, in the years since we started this special brand of work, um, a lot has changed. We now have vaccines have become nearly universally accessible to workers. Um, those of us who were working remotely have begun filtering back into work sites, either full-time, part-time, or hybrid. Um, people who have been on site throughout have worked through the first rounds of critical, critical work they did with their employers to stay safe. And we're sort of approaching a new normal. Just as we thought we looked, knew what the new normal was going to look like, we also have had lots of curveballs thrown at us by the virus itself and by the changing recommendations we've had from our science community. It seemed like a really great time to take a step back and revisit the question, what can we do to take care of ourselves at work? And most importantly, the really important, the most important question is what can we do locally right here in our work sites? So much of the debate about health and safety has felt like it happens at the WHO or in Washington DC or at the CDC, there's so many things we can do right here as workers in our daily lives and so much more protection we can gain by paying attention to the things that are in our hands to take care of. That's tonight's meeting. And I'm gonna turn it over to Amanda to start. There you go. Thank you, Adair. It is so lovely to meet all of you. I'm so glad that we're here together to learn about how to build health and safety in the workplace. Um, particularly, this is a kind of uh, work that has to be led by you in your workplaces. So we're so happy to be here supporting you all. Um, so I'm gonna talk about what our goals are for um, the workshop today. So really we're looking to provide accurate, not super technical information about ways to mitigate COVID exposure um, at the workplace and to provide workers, organizers and safety committee members with ideas that you can use for concrete improvement, um, concrete proposals to improve objective um, safety in your workplace. Um, to provide workers with information about your rights to form health and safety committees under Washington Administrative Code, and to have some practice time for all of us to learn how to use these tools. Um, so we're going to introduce you to safety guides, um, DIY hacks that you can use um, to really further COVID safety in your workplace tomorrow. Um, so the agenda is that we'll be um, going through, we'll be doing a time of introductions um, where we'll really be using the chat to learn who's in the room and what you're hoping to get out of the workshop today. And then we're gonna go into a PowerPoint that hits on the general principles of COVID safety. We'll have a chance in breakoff groups to um, workshop negotiating proposals for COVID safety. And we'll end with a panel with public health experts on specific workplace concerns. And that panel is really gonna be based on your questions. 
So as you're going along and as you're um, learning information tonight, keep your questions, jot them down. You'll have a chance to ask experts um, at the end. So I would love to introduce um, COVID Straight Talk Lab, which is the organization that I'm representing. Um, we're a bilingual public health campaign. Um, and our mission is really to work in coalition with workers to further COVID safety um, legislation and support contract negotiations. Um, we believe that um, this pandemic will not end before we take air ventilation seriously. So a lot of the workshop today is gonna be focused on air ventilation um, and why it's so important. And we're an organization that brings together scientists with labor unions and worker centers to further um, better indoor air um, that is gonna keep people COVID safe. Um, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Marina to introduce um, Naikash. Thank you so much, Amanda, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us on. My name is Maria Jatsky. I'm the industrial hygienist at NICOSH, which is a New York City-based organization. We are a nonprofit, health and safety oriented. We work with individual workers, with unions, with community-based organizations, and really anyone who is at all interested in or related to occupational health and safety. We work on training and education, we work on legislation, we do site visits and technical assistance for really anyone who needs it. And our core idea is that every person who should return from work in the exact same condition that they left for work that morning or whatever your schedule is. Thank you. Um, and so Adair, I was going to turn it over to you just to do any further introduction of the Washington State Labor and Education Research Center. Um, and we can't hear you. Move still forward. Here. You can move forward. Okay, great. Yeah. So um, we wanted to let you know who the public health experts are that you'll be hearing from today. So we have Dr. Lupita Montoya. Um, she's a first generation scientist um, in the field of aerosol science and indoor quality, air quality. She's done um, extensive collaborations with communities of color around being sure that um, science is benefiting marginalized and low income communities, specifically working with nail salon workers, um, working with the Navajo Nation, as well as Latino homes in Boulder, Colorado. So we're so excited to have you here tonight, uh, Dr. Lupita Montoya. We'll also be hearing from Dr. Marissa Baker, um, who's an assistant professor in the UW Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences. Um, she has done extensive research um, with vulnerable or underrepresented groups. Um, and dur during the COVID-19 pandemic, she's been working closely with a variety of worker organizations, government and industry partners to characterize physical and mental health outcomes experienced by workers due to the pandemic. Um, finally, we'll have Marina Jabsky, who will also be going through the PowerPoint with me, who's an industrial hygienist out of NICOSH, um, who provides technical assistance, support, training, and conducts investigations and risk assessments related to concerns about exposures to workplace hazards. So all of our experts today have extensive experience in working with labor unions and worker centers to really further these safety principles on the ground. So I would love to now turn to the chat and ask you to introduce yourself if you haven't already with your name, your gender pronoun, how you want to be referred to, whether that's she, her, they, them, he, him, um, your union or organization. And then what is one thing that you are looking to get out of the workshop today? Again, we wanna be sure that this is useful to you, that it's information that's actionable for you in the workplace. Um, so take a moment, introduce yourself in the chat I'll be reading out who's in the room. Um, again, we wanna be sure that the information we provide today is directly useful for your workplace. So um, feel free to put your name in the chat as we go along. Um, I'll pause to uh, read out introductions as we're going. Um, first, I would love to welcome Liz Brown. She, her, Teamster Local 763, and looking for resources to help assess risks. Thank you, Liz. We're going to be going through a lot of resources to assess risks today. We also have Eva Lopez, SEIU 925. 
Um, Eva, if there's anything in particular you're looking forward to get information about today, uh, feel free to put that in the chat. And as folks continue to introduce themselves, I'll be reading those out. We have Madeline Binot, she, her, UFCW21, looking to get ideas about how to disseminate COVID safety information to workers in a meaningful way. Um, and that you work with grocery store workers specifically. That's perfect. A lot of our information tonight is gonna be focused on how do you really disseminate this information, right? Because we know that we can only really have uh, COVID safety in the workplace through being unified. And so a lot of that means disseminating information. So I'm gonna keep going, but please do put your name, your pronoun, your organization, and what you would like to get out of the workshop in the chat, and I'll keep reading those out. So today we're gonna to be talking about three real um, principles of COVID safety. Um, I'm sorry, the chat <laughs> may have just taken up the whole screen. When we think about COVID safety, there's three pillars that we need to keep in mind whenever we're thinking about how to make our workplaces more COVID safe. Masking, air quality, and distance. If you have one and not the other two, you're gonna have problems. If you have two and not the three, you're still gonna have problems. So every approach to COVID safety really needs to touch on all three of these pillars of masking, air quality, and physical distancing. And again, we feel that you really can't have COVID safety in the workplace without organized power, right? And that really comes from workers banding together. So we want you to know that you have rights to organize for health and safety in your workplace. The National Labor Relations Act protects your right to collectively bargain and um, have a say over the health and safety of your workplace. And the right to report and, and the right to refuse dangerous work is an OSHA regulation that also gives you the right to refuse to work um, if there are dangerous conditions in your workplace. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Marina to take us through some more principles of COVID safety and get deeper into the Swiss cheese approach. Amanda. So the Swiss cheese approach is kind of a fun, but also easy for everyone to visualize a way of how we discuss and how we can uh, conceptualize and implement different safety strategies. So the idea here, and this we're gonna be touching on over and over during this evening. But the idea here is, as Amanda was saying with masking air and distancing, there is no way that you can only implement one solution and have that be all that you're doing, right? COVID, infective disease in general, especially what we've been seeing with COVID is not a one and done situation. We really need to have a combination of different strategies. And the way you can kind of see this is if, is, with this, this cheese approach, right? So if you're making a cheese sandwich or a sandwich with this cheese as a factor, right? You know that when you layer the cheese, there's going to be holes and you do have the risk of having a section of the, of the sandwich that is cheeseless, which would make us all very, very sad. So what you want to do is you want to keep layering the strategy so that you cover and you have as many layers as possible so that you cover all of your holes, all of the gaps. So it's the same idea with safety, right? Social distancing alone is not going to be enough. Masking alone is not going to be enough. Even air ventilation on its own is not going to be enough. But the combination of ventilation, the combination of masking, the combination of distancing, of, um, of quarantine or staying isolated, isolated, excuse me, when you're, when you're sick, of hygiene practices such as hand washing, of vaccination, of making sure that our, uh, we keep our services, surfaces clean, right? All of these things layered together, that is going to give us enough layers, enough options to cover all of our holes, okay? Um, I think, uh, Amanda, I don't know if you disappeared, but looking at, uh, at the Swiss cheese approach, how risky is your workplace? Where are you with stopping the holes and which holes is the virus getting through? And please feel free to put that into. Yeah, so we would love to hear from you as you're learning um, this new sort of approach to thinking about COVID safety, right? The Swiss cheese approach um, in which the more layers of cheese you have, the less risky your workplace is, right? 
um, where are the where are is your workplace stopping the holes? Which holes is the virus getting through? How safe do you think your workplace is in looking back at the Swiss cheese approach to COVID safety? So feel free to sort of look through these different um, slices of cheese, right? Physical distancing, occupancy levels, ventilation, the ability to quarantine and have isolation. How COVID safe do you think your workplace is? So Elizabeth says the mass war is continu in, continue in workplaces I represent. Many workplaces just don't bother anymore with masking. It's an excellent point, Elizabeth. So you can think through air ventilation, physical distancing, do you work in a crowded workplace? Madeline puts in the chat, physical distancing has also lessened. So it seems like um, what people are noticing is that even if your workplace maybe had more slices of cheese for that as the pandemic has gone on, some of these cheese slices of cheese have fallen away. Um, so Marina, I'll turn it back to you to well, let's go to, yeah, how's, so let's talk about some basics about how COVID-19 is transmitted for the purpose that we understand what we need to focus on, how to prevent transmission, right? So we know that the person-to-person -person ways are primarily through droplet transmission and airborne aerosol transmission. And then we also know that there is a risk associated with contaminated surfaces. Now, I am going to start with contaminated surfaces. I know it's a little backwards, but I think it's the easiest way to understand. We have to understand first and foremost how virus can get into our bodies, right? And we need to, it's important for us to keep in mind as we're thinking about our contaminated surfaces that COVID-19 is not transmitted through the skin, right? So what we're concerned about, what we should be concerned about are our mucous membranes, which is nose, mouth, and eyes. So even if you do come in contact with live virus on a surface, which is possible, that's true, as long as you do not then uh, transmit that live virus from the surface to your hand, for example, to your face, the risk of you becoming infected from a contaminated surface is very, very low. This is where our hygiene practices are super important, right? You cannot become infected just by touching a contaminated surface with your hand, there has to be some kind of transmission to the mucous membranes, which again, nose, mouth, and eyes. So we gotta keep that in mind, right? Now, the person-to-person -person aspects are a, a little bit more involved. So we've been, you've been, all been hearing a lot about droplets. So what is a droplet? A droplet is exactly what you see in this image. It is essentially a drop of fluid, hence the name droplet. A drop of fluid that has uh, particles of virus embedded in that liquid. So here you see a droplet that has uh, viral particles of SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19 in it. Now, what, um, what happens with droplets is because they tend to have, uh, because of the amount of fluid they have, they tend to be, we call them heavy, but this is all relative, right? Uh, they tend to be a little bit on the heavier side. How do we get droplets? Droplets are expelled when we, we most often think that we're only expelling droplets when we sneeze or cough, but it's important for us to understand that we also are expelling droplets potentially when we're just doing normal conversation, right? You don't have to be loud, you don't have to be quick, normal conversation, and also even sometimes during normal breathing. And same idea with aerosols. And what an aerosol is, is essentially a dehydrated droplet. It's just a droplet that has much less liquid in it. So this, this little liquid sac with the viral particles is a little bit smaller, but it still is essentially a viral particles embedded in a lot less fluid. And because it has less fluid, they are smaller and lighter. So where a droplet will is heavy enough that it will fall to the ground within seconds or minutes, aerosols will remain suspended in the air potentially for hours. So what that means for us in terms of prevention is we have to be, uh, and Amanda, if you could go to the next slide, I'm kind of leading into that. So when we're talking about prevention, because aerosols can remain suspended 
in the air for several hours, we need to think of strategies that, in terms of prevention strategies that all that deal with droplets, uh, which behave in one way and aerosols, which behave slightly differently. So we need to have strategies that cover, uh, that cover both, okay? And next slide. So this is where ventilation becomes really, really important, right? When we're dealing with, um, with droplet transmission, uh, sorry, let me, let me back up a second, actually. Uh, when we're dealing with, this is what we're talking about with layering strategies, right? We have, um, we have seen studies that have shown that ventilation on its own or masking on its own are not, are not sufficient. There was a study earlier last year from out of Spain where they did a simulation between uh, in a scenario where they had one infected person in the room with no ventilation and nobody masked with uh, same scenario, same room, everybody was masked, one infected person and same scenario, same room, everybody's masked and there's ventilation. And what they found was we, in the first scenario, no masking, no ventilation. After two hours, everybody's infected. In the room where uh, there is no ventilation, but everybody's masked, roughly 50% of the people in the room become infected after two hours. In the scenario that uh, everyone's masked and there is ventilation, only two people out of 24 become infected after two hours. So that really shows both that we need to, again, reinforces the importance of layering and also reinforces the importance of ventilation for that dramatic drop. So with that lead in, what do we mean by ventilation? Now, the ventilation we're probably most familiar with is what we would call natural ventilation, right? So using windows to bring in fresh air and possibly opening a door on the opposite side to get that draft. Now, is this a reliable form of ventilation for the purpose of viral control? And the answer is not really. It is better than nothing, absolutely. But if we want to be very precise about how we are moving air through a space, and when we're dealing with infectious diseases, we really do want to be precise. The problem with even natural ventilation is how much air you're getting, how fast the air is coming in, all of these things depend on factors, external factors that are outside of control, right? Is it if we're waiting for, if we need to bring in fresh air from the window, well, is it windy that day? That's gonna impact how the air moves. Is the wind blowing in a different direction from the window that you have open? Do you have a door that is opposite your window that you can get that draft or is the door on the same side as your windows? All of these things are going to impact how much air you're getting. So you're not really having reliable airflow from the day to day. So if you can't rely fully on, and again, natural ventilation better than no ventilation at all, but ideally you want mechanical ventilation. There it is. So I'm gonna run through this. Don't be, do not be alarmed about the, the specs on the slide. I'm gonna run through this. It, this is a lot, a lot less dangerous than it looks. So essentially what you want is when you're dealing, what you ultimately want from ventilation is you want to bring fresh air in and contaminated air out. So this is broadly speaking, what a mechanical system would look like. Uh, now, so you have uh, right up top left here, you have your outdoor air intake. So this is, sorry, I have some trucks in the background. So you have your, fresh air coming in from the outside. You're drawing it in. We're going to ignore the mixing chamber for a minute. You're drawing the, uh, the, the, excuse me, the fresh air in. And what you want to do first is you want to filter it for any, any contamination you're getting from the outside. Uh, dust, debris, uh, you know, depending on where your air intake is, you might get off-gassing from parked cars, tobacco, whatever it is. So you're filtering all of that out and then you are going to want to do what we call condition, right, which is dealing with temperature and humidity, depending on if it's summer or winter, right, whatever the situation is, you're going to want to condition it. So you've filtered your air, you've conditioned your air, and then you want to push your air out into the room where people are actually occupying space. So that happens through your supply air diffusers. You're pushing that air out into the space. 
air is circulating in the space. And then what do we say, right? We want to bring fresh air in and take contaminated air out. So how do we get contaminated air out of, out of the space? So you have on the, all the way on the right hand side, you have these uh, return air uh, grills. So that is pulling, uh, that is going to bring the contaminated air out. And then you have to decide, are we going to exhaust the air or are we going to recirculate the air, right? Now, uh, where, depending on what space you're working in, you might choose to do uh, one or a combination of both. So again, depends on what kind of building you're in, what work is being done there. But generally speaking, um, air from the bathrooms and from highly contaminated areas gets exhausted out. Air from like offices, classrooms, et cetera, you probably will uh, recirculate, in which case it goes back through the mixing chamber, meets new incoming fresh air in the mixing chamber, and off you go. Okay, so that is basically how mechanical ventilation works. Now, um, what you probably uh, have heard before the term air changes. So essentially what an air change is, is you are replacing all of the contaminated, all of the air in the room with new fresh air. So every time you do that, that is an air change. You are changing all the air in a room. Air changes per hour is simply the number of times you are completely replacing all the air in the room in a given hour. For the purposes of uh, controlling the spread of COVID-19, a very smart uh, group of industrial hygienists have figured out that the, uh, the corresponding number of air changes to relative risk reduction of viral transmission. And for our purposes, the number to aim for is six air changes per hour, which corresponds roughly to 95% risk reduction. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, you've probably also heard uh, about these MERV-13 filters or HEPA filters or what have you. So what that is, right? So remember we talked about filtration. So you wanna filter the air for debris from the outside. You also wanna filter the air for the virus itself, ideally. So there are a variety of ways that you can set up filters in the workspace. I'm not gonna get into it, technical time and not really our purpose for today, but what you're dealing with when you deal with uh, the filters is the filter we have found shows a good reduction in, uh, in filtering out particles that are the size of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, are MERV-13 filters. So if you can get a MERV-13 filter or higher, that is the filter you want. So again, we're dealing with, now again, think about the Swiss cheese layering, right? You want to combine different approaches, combine different layers. with six air changes per hour, that's one layer. MERV-13 filter, that's another layer, okay? So all of these things in combination are going to help get you to the goal that you need. All right, next slide, please. Now, we also need to talk about what is not effective ventilation. And the thing is that you, your employer or whoever might tell you, oh, though our space is perfectly safe, we have all of these standing air fans to provide ventilation, or we have all these window AC units that provide ventilation. And the thing we really need to understand is these things are not ventilation, not for the ventilate, not for the purposes that we need for, uh, excuse me, for infection control. A standing fan like this on the left, all that really does is move air around that is already in the room. It creates wind, it creates turbulence. It's great for comfort if you want to breeze, but for the purposes of bringing in fresh air in and removing contaminated air, it cannot do that. Same thing with the window AC unit, right? Sure, it does have uh, a generic filter that does filter out debris from the outside when you're bringing fresh air in, but it has no capacity to expel contaminated air back out into the room. So these things are for comfort and they're great for comfort, but they are not going to help you in terms of infection control, okay? And then last but not least, freestanding air filtration units. Now, I cannot stress this enough. Ideally, you are using these freestanding filtration units in addition to a mechanical 
system, right? If you cannot, for whatever reason, if the ventilation system you have in place cannot handle MERV-13 filters, you want additional filtration, great. You can use these in addition to it. If you have no option, if you do not have a mechanical ventilation system and you're dependent entirely on natural ventilation, perhaps you want to use these in addition to. If you have neither, you know, neither uh, mechanical ventilation system nor natch, nor the ability to open windows, ideally you will get in with your bargaining groups and push for something better, but these can be potentially a standing. But ideally, these are not going to be the only, your only line of defense. Now, that being said, if you are using filtration units in addition to, or for whatever purpose, some things that uh, I'd like you to keep in mind, first and foremost is they have to be placed along areas of airflow, right? If you stick your portable filtration unit in the corner, you're not, it's not really doing any good. Uh, nobody's there, air is not really flowing from the corners, so it's great to keep it out of the way, but it's also out of the way of airflow, right? Um, you also want to make sure that you're getting units that are filtration only. Any of the, uh, any of these sanitizers, ozone emitters, ionizers, they produce, we know some of them produce ozone, which is hazardous on its own, bad for a respiratory system. Uh, some UV light is also not something you want to be sitting next to. Um, and a lot of these things generate ions that we can't always identify, let alone know what they do. So if you're going to have a portable unit, filtration only. All right. And with that, I think I turn it over to Amanda. For me. So we want to know from you how do this is a lot of information, right? And I know when I first learned a lot of this, it took a while to sink in, you know, so it's it's not something that and I think that that's, you know, part of why employers can sometimes get away with doing less, right? Because this is complicated. So we really want to be empowering you with like all of the information so you can really understand like if your employer is doing a good job or not. So what are your thoughts? How is your workplace doing with air ventilation and filtration? What risks do you see? Do you have an employer who said, oh, well, we just have this unit in our window. You'll be fine. Or maybe your employer said, well, we'll just bring in these fans and that'll make all the difference. What risks are you seeing in your workplace given what we just talked about? And again, uh, we have invited uh, uh, our safety officer, David Klein, along with um, I'm sorry, uh, you, you got muted again. Can you um, unmute yourself? I'm sorry, I think we lost you. Um, feel free to put what you were saying in the chat. I'm sorry that we lost you mid thought. Um, Adair says it's really hard to find out about the status of our ventilation system. Exactly. That's probably a really common experience that people have had. Um, this is really technical and, um, and yet um, it's, it's really at, again, of those pillars of masking, air and distancing, the, all three need to be present to really be COVID safe, right? And so you have every right to find out about your building's ventilation system. Um, Elizabeth says, COVID has amplified pre-existing complaints about air quality. One success is that employers actually, in some cases, included employees in meetings with contractors coming in to service uh, ventilation. Adair is right. Usually secrecy surrounds ventilation, safety, and cleanliness. So again, who does that benefit? It benefits the employer, right? Um, if the employer does not want to be spending more money on these systems, but that doesn't benefit the workers, right? Um, I am wondering if um, the person who, if, if folks want to just for a moment popcorn your thoughts, um, or the person who is speaking that, that got cut off, feel free to unmute yourself and share some of the risks that you're seeing at your work. Um, and if you've found any successes, um, we, we only have a few minutes, but it would be great to hear because again, this is technical. Um, and so the more that we can talk about the actual conditions in the workplace, the more that we're able to unpack this technical information, right? So what other kinds of air ventilation risks are you seeing? 
Um, we've heard a lot about secrecy. Um, we've heard a lot about um, employers not being willing to put money into the costs around mechanical ventilation. What other kinds of, um, Marina says another one that you've heard is employers who are overwhelmed with workers with stacks of data and not all of it relevant to make it difficult to parse out. So maybe your employer gives you too much information, which is why it's so important to like know the basic principles for yourself so you can kind of cut through the information that's not useful. So any other thoughts folks wanna share about risks that you're seeing in your workplace related to air ventilation or any success stories? Um, brief anecdotes about ways that you've actually seen things change on a positive level around air ventilation in your workplace. So hold on to those, think about it. Um, we'll have more of a chance to share um, about actual workplace conditions when we get into breakoff groups. Marina, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Amanda. So we've talked a bit now about ventilation. So let's talk a little bit about social distancing, right? This is the other one that we, uh, since the beginning, we've been told social distancing, six feet apart, very important. And the question now is, is that still relevant with airborne or aerosol transmission, right? And the answer is yes and no, right? It very much depends on where you are. Social distancing is very impact, very um, effective when you're dealing with droplet transmission only, right? Because there's only so far the droplet can travel before it arcs down to the ground. But when we're dealing with airborne aerosols, which can remain suspended in the air for, again, for hours, remember, it really matters if you are indoors or out of doors. Out of doors, you have pretty much constant ventilation, right? The, when, uh, when you expel aerosols, they expand, they, uh, they spread out, and they are immediately like ventilated, and there's no buildup of concentration of the viral particles in, you know, in, any, in any real capacity because you have constant airflow and no limit, right? If you're outside, where's the air going to go? Everywhere. So in that respect, social distancing helps because it really basically is now protecting you from having someone talk and spit directly in your face. When you're dealing with indoor environment, however, it's a very different story. If you've ever been in the same indoor space with a smoker, right? If someone is smoking in the room with you, it doesn't matter if you are on opposite sides of the room, you're going to smell the smoke, right? And it's the same idea with uh, with viral particles, right? When you expel, uh, when you're expelling um, these airborne aerosols, right? If you have a room that is not well ventilated, then there's going to be, and that contaminated, sorry, that contaminated air is not being exhausted out. What you're essentially going to have is you're going to have a buildup of, of these infectious airborne particles, infectious aerosols that are just going to remain suspended in the room. If you're in the room for hours, that means you have hours worth of buildup, right? So that is, and what we saw in that, um, in that study out of Spain that I mentioned earlier, it doesn't really seem to matter where in the room you are because air expands to fill the space it's in. So because of, uh, because of that, social distancing in the respect of making sure you're six feet apart from people indoors does not really tend to work. However, what does what does seem to work or at least work better is limiting occupancy, limiting the number of people that you can have in an indoor space. The reason that works is you're essentially limiting your potential number of infected people. And by doing that, you are limiting the amount of infectious particles that they can expel and therefore you are lowering the concentration. So in that respect, uh, that works, but social distancing, not so much. So that is the distancing conversation. And now again, last but not least, personal protective equipment. Now we're gonna talk about respiratory protection in a second, different types of, uh, of masks and respirators. So hang on to that for one second, but I do wanna highlight that if you, for, if you're wearing a face shield, please keep in mind that a face shield is not respiratory protection. 
the face shield is there only to prevent you from getting the splash of somebody's droplets essentially right so if you're in an environment you're working in close setting with patients students customers whoever it is and you have the opportunity there's a possibility that someone might cough or sneeze in your face that's what the face shield is for but it needs to be worn in combination with respiratory protection okay and um yep and uh with gloves if you need to wear them for whatever reason, great, but just keep in mind that you're not touching, if you have contaminated gloves, don't touch your face or your or your phone or your keys, because essentially it's not like you're, you know, you might not be wearing gloves if you're going to be touching your face with them. Okay, and then let's talk about masking really briefly, and then that'll be, uh, that'll be the end of this section. So there are different types of respirators and masks, uh, basically, we can break this down into, and you can see it's color coded for you. Uh, essentially, you're dealing with tight fitting or loose fitting. Now, tight fitting tends to be your uh, usually your respirators, your N95s, KN95s, the uh, KF94s, uh, or the combination of um, of a mask with a um, uh, with something that will help the fit, right? And the idea there is having that tight fitting, uh, the tight fitting face piece is meant to create a seal between your face and the, and the face piece. And the idea there is that forces the air you're inhaling to go through the filtering face piece, as opposed to if you're wearing a loose mask, then air can go in anywhere it wants because it's loose. You have holes here, holes here, axes there, etc. The idea here again, tight fitting face pieces, much, much more effective at protecting you than loose fitting face pieces. And some materials are um, even worse. And all right, so on to you, Amanda. You're on mute. Thank you. Um, before we go off into breakoff groups where you're going to have a lot more of a chance to synthesize all this information and think about what this means for your workplace, we wanted to emphasize that this isn't just technical information, right? This is information that's really about equity in this country. Um, we know that Black, Latinx, and Indigenous communities have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. We also know that um, interventions like mechanical air ventilation cost more. Right, so when we think about the story of like, why is this new information for most of us, right? Why, why do a lot of us not even know what an aerosol is? It's really something we should be outraged about because this is information that, that the leaders of our country have had, that scientists have, everybody who works in infectious disease understands that air ventilation is essential if you're gonna really fight a pandemic, like, like a, an airborne pandemic, and yet, the interventions that are needed haven't been done often because they're costly. And that's and the communities that have been holding the brunt of that inaction are the ones that, again, communities of color who've really held um, the ways that, that, that health impacts have negatively impacted um, communities of color historically, right? And so we can think about environmental racism and other ways in which communities of color have been disproportionately impacted by inaction that is gonna affect human health, right? Um, inaction from federal leaders, as well as inaction from employers. Um, so we see air ventilation as an equity issue and something that our country has a moral obligation to take seriously as we're fighting this pandemic. Um, so we're gonna go into break off groups now where, where you'll have more of a chance to think about some concrete proposals that you would want to bring in your workplace organizing. We encourage you to think about how is your workplace doing with distancing, masking, and again, when we talked about air ventilation before. This also would be a good time to think about clarifying questions. Um, we went through a lot of information. We're going to have an expert panel at the end where you can ask questions, right? And you can ask clarifying questions about what we talked about here. So take a moment, think about what, what came up for you as we were going through this PowerPoint. Um, as questions that you just really don't understand yet. You know, if you're like, I don't understand what an air change is, or tell me more about what a filter is, or I don't understand how to find the right kind of portable unit still, right? Um, so think about what your clarifying questions are. Um, again, we'll, we'll, we'll turn to your questions when we get to the expert panel. 
Um, we also wanted to share some further resources with you. So when I stop my screen share, I'm gonna put a few resources in the chat. The first is called the Masking, Air and Distancing Policy Guide, which COVID Straight Talk Lab and Nikash created together that goes through everything we just talked about today. It goes through all the best practices around masking, air and distancing. So you don't need to remember everything that we talked about. You're gonna be getting a guide that's gonna walk you through all of that. We will also include a link to hacks where you can see some do-it-yourself solutions to make your workplace more COVID safe. Um, so these are gonna be the resources that, that I'll be putting in the chat once I stop my screen share. Um, so that's, that's what we have uh, for our PowerPoint. Um, and so we're gonna move into breakout groups shortly. Um, so the format of the breakout groups is we're gonna have four um, breakout groups. I'm sorry, let me just close this out. Um, we're gonna have four different breakout groups. So we're gonna have one breakout group for people who are in a situation right now where you're in active bargaining with your employer, actively bargaining around an MOU related to COVID safety. We're gonna have a second breakout group for people who are in a health and safety committee in your workplace. Um, so you may not be in active negotiations, um, but you do have a health and safety committee and health and safety has been something that your workplace has taken on in the past. We'll have a third breakout group for people who are working on some sort of policy um, on the state level, on the federal level, working to pass COVID safe legisla um, uh, legislation that will ensure that workplaces are more COVID safe. Um, so we will again have a breakout group for people working on policy. And fourthly, we'll have our breakout group for everyone else. So if you don't identify as any of those groups, go into the last group, um, that'll be the group for you. And in these groups, we are going to be using a resource called Jamboard. Um, Jamboard is a great resource to use when taking notes, shared notes. I'm gonna put in the chat right now, a link um, to the Jamboard link. And I would ask for everyone to open it right now. Um, the reason why I say that is when you go into your breakout group, you are going to lose access to the chat. So I've put the Jamboard link in the chat. Please do open that now. Um, that will bring you up to a place where you will see the prompt for your breakout group, and you'll also have a place to take notes. Um, so please do open that link now. Um, I'm also going to put in the chat now the link to the MAD Plus policy guide that I just uh, spoke about, which goes through, again, the best practices on masking, air, and distancing. And I'm also putting in the chat a link to hacks um, where you can see do-it-yourself solutions for making your workplace more COVID safe. So um, please take a moment, open these three links now. So you have them up, they'll all be useful in your breakoff groups. So again, that's the Jamboard link. That's the link to the COVID Straight Talk policy, uh, the mask, air, and distancing policy guide. Um, and that's the link to hacks. And then choose what breakout group you want to go to. Um, so you'll see on the right-hand side, there's a little button that says join. So think about which um, breakout group most resonates with you. So again, if you're on a bargaining team that's in active negotiations on COVID safety, you're part of a health and safety committee. If you're working on policy or if you just wanna be in a general group with everyone else. So um, you'll see um, on the, again, the right-hand side where it says join. And if you don't choose a breakout group, we will just assign you to one um, and you'll have an opportunity to sort of um, talk about whichever topic you get assigned to. So again, there's the bargaining team, health and safety committee, policy and everyone else. And we'll come back together in about 10 minutes. And if you've never joined a breakout room voluntarily, you look down at the little tic-tac-toe symbol on the bottom of your screen and click on it and it will show each of the rooms and you can click on a blue join. Just click join and you can go. Amanda, there's a question about access to the Jamboard. Do you have any experience in people being unable to get to the Jamboard without already having, oh, I think she's gone. I think Amanda's left, but um, try copying and pasting it into your browser instead of just clicking on it. Um, that'd be the first recommendation um, I have. If you're on a phone, it might look a little different. Um, I'm gonna try and 
open it on my phone just to, to see what it looks like and help you out if you're having trouble. Send me a message if you need me, Emily. Gotcha. Are you okay? Me? Let's see. Um, Catherine. Catherine, it will be here in uh, holding down the fort in the homeroom. Not at the drop. Oh, hello. Hi. Hey. I think I downloaded them all. I'm going to turn off recording right now because we usually turn off recording.